It gives me a great, great pleasure and honor to host you today in this talk, in this inspirational talk. I must say that I am lucky to have you as a mentor for, my, for me and to have you in my life. Very few are those people who have achieved this level of education and of scientific discovery and of uh, uh, so much recognition yet kept their uh, humbleness and you reached the moon but you kept your feet on ground. So I'm happy to host you today. Uh, throughout our talk, we will be highlighting major stops in your life, achievements, challenges, personal growth, professional growth, fears, aspirations, and insights about the current uncertain times that we are all going through. So Dr. Farrow, you are a world-renowned scientist. You are the director of the Center of Remote Sensing at Boston University, a geologist, professor, researcher. You were involved in the Apollo mission to the moon. You are an advisor to many past and present presidents and a very, very valuable member of Mentor Arabia Foundation. You obtained six, more than six honorary doctorates from prestigious universities. You have received so many international awards and recognitions. Lately, in 2018, you received the Enamory International Ethics Prize. And uh, finally, the newly discovered uh, asteroid was named after you. And I must add also that in Star, Star Trek, the, the very famous movie, a ship was named after you in the season of, I think, uh, 1989 or 1988. So as, as a person from Egypt to the world, how do you think you're bringing up, influence the person you are today? Thank you very much, dear Soraya, for this incredible introduction. I'm very proud of you personally. And uh, all of your, the things that you listed, I'm proud of them all, and I m must say that it is because I am an Egyptian of, of Arab origin, and I was brought up in, a, in, in a, an Arab society, and it gives me pleasure to be able to expose the Arab society and the Egyptianness to the world in this fashion. So how, how did you spend your childhood and your education? How did it, uh, uh, how, how did it help you to reach where you are now? In my childhood, I was really very, uh, very studious. Uh, actually, it was uh, when I was very, very young, before I went into primary school, my mm -hmm. older brother, Osama, went to my father and, told, and said to him, if, you, if I take Farouk and give him the, uh, all of the material for the, the grade one during the summer, he will pass grade one. He, he doesn't have to go to grade one at all in the mm -hmm. primary school because I can teach him all of this material in the summer. My father laughed and he said, you can't do that. And Osama said, yes, I can. And my father told him, okay. So Osama came to me and made a deal. He said, in the morning, you sit with me, I will teach you. And then in the afternoon, you can go play with Osama. Osama was older than I, between mm -hmm. Osama and me, myself. And he knew that I loved to run around in the streets and the parks and so on with Osama. So he said, but not in the morning. In the morning, I'll teach you. And with Osama, you, mm -hmm. you can play in the afternoon. And he taught me during the summer all of the material for grade one. And my father, I went to my father and told him that. So my father took me to school. He, he spoke to the principal and the teachers and he told them his father, his brother taught him all of this material. They said, okay, we will examine him. If he passes in all of them, we'll put him in grade two. So I, I, I took a few days to, to take these exams and I passed them all and they put me in grade two. So I, that's the reason when I graduated from, uh, from, from, uh, from college with 20 years of age. Well, hard, hard work, hard work pays. Huh? So yes. when, you were, you, when you were a little child and you used to observe the moon or look at the moon, did it ever occur to you that one day you will be involved in discovering the moon, like literally directly? Not at all. We, were, we, were, we always looked at the moon in wonder like everybody else, and we used the moon to tell us about the, month, the different months and this and that, and that's it. So what was the major turning point in your life? From Egypt to the States, becoming a geologist and involved with NASA and the moon discovery. And we will talk more about, about the Apollo mission and uh, your work with NASA. When I was in school, in high school, specifically the first few years of high school, I really loved science. And the teachers were fabulous teachers then. 
the teachers at that time were, were just very, very, very good teachers and took care of us and taught us a great deal. And then the teacher was keen on the fact that I, I was able to answer all of his questions on science. And then he once brought in a fish and he started to dissect it so we can see the bone structure of the fish. And they told him, can I do that? And he said, you can? I said, yes. And so I said, okay, come on here. Just to show me. So I did because I actually watched my mother peeling the fish and peeling the bone away from the fish. And they did it and he said, very good. Next time he brought a, uh, a frog and he said, Farouk, come here. And you, you cut this, dissect this frog to show us the interior of it. And they went and, they, and he said, fabulous, very good. This kid, Farouk, is going to be a great surgeon. Huh? He's going to be a brain surgeon. So that was, to me, I was going to be a, a medical doctor. Not just that, I'm going to be a surgeon. Yes. And you went to geology after that. You yes. Said, and, uh, I really didn't know what geology was when I was in high school and so on. But I loved the, the Boy Scouts. And there was the, the, the chief of the Eagle Scouts, uh, mm -hmm. the group of Eagle Scouts of the, of the high school. And I used to love going to the Mokatta Mountains. We lived in Cairo then during these years, and we used to live to live close enough to the Mokatta Mountain and the, the Red Mountain and the Yellow Mountain, near, near east of Cairo, were really very beautiful, and I loved them. And after the, the Boy Scout trips, I would go and take my sisters and show them the places and so on where I saw. And when I finished high school, I, I knew that I was going to go to the medical school because the teacher said, yeah, I was going to be a, a surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> you went, uh, and, and instead, you went to the moon. So Dr. Farouk, whenever, whenever your name is mentioned, we cannot but remember the Apollo moon exploration mission. And with NASA, you were the eye of the astronauts. You were the one in charge of giving them information and facts to make smooth landing on the moon, if, if I'm right. So how was that experience? Can you tell us more about it? It was fabulous. First of all, I never had a course in astronomy. And maybe that was good, because when I got that job, it was a job, the only job that I could get when I immigrated to the, to the United States in 1966, and that was the only job I could get. So I went there and knew that I have to fight out my way because I have to learn. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when I joined, I found out that there were about like 2,000 pictures of the moon at the time, and I thought to myself, I should learn them all one by one thoroughly so that I'd be able to talk to the fellow geologists in the program because they have been working with that for a very long period of time and I'm new and I don't know anything. So I did and it was really the, uh, the fact that I did all of that, prepared myself fully so I can be at least able to talk to the fellow geologists and that's in, in a year later it was this bunch of geologists that elected me to be the secretary of the group which was responsible for selection of landing sites. Interesting, so how did you feel when, when you really had, had to make a decision uh, about informing astronauts where to land and how to land. And, and how, how, how is, is what the first time in history? Yes, and it how was a that huge make, decision. Okay, it was a huge big responsibility as well. Very, very large. Because it was really, because if they, if they went to the place that was not right, or if they went to the place and then there were blocks in their way that, that uh, affected the mission and they died, which was a possibility, you, how, how would you feel? You would feel uh, terrible. This, this was very hard. Incredible. So we yes. really had to be absolutely certain of the, in the best possible way. That's why we studied very thoroughly every single possibility, very thoroughly so that we can make absolutely certain that we are not exposing the astronauts to any, any danger of any sort, no yes. matter how small. Dr. Farouk, what is stopping Arab astronauts nowadays from being selected to take part in such missions? I mean, we have, we have individual capacities. I believe we have the knowledge. Why we are not, as Arabs or Arab countries, active players in the scientific discovery field? What is stopping us? And there is a lot of money also in this part of the world. So. It's the fact that all of our governments are irrelevant and so stupid in my view, so incapable, do not understand their own people. They are there to enrich themselves or to feel good about themselves. None 
of the Arab governments are doing a good job, period. That's it. So, unfortunately, um, when, when, I'm, when I was thinking about our talk today, I couldn't escape, of course, the news about the launch of SpaceX Dragon Endeavour, which took place last week, and when the astronauts entered the International Space Station. So, according to Elon Musk, we, he says, or he believes that, who is the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, he believes that we are facing an existential risk to the long-term survival of the mankind on Earth and on planet. And that's why we must discover other planets and be ready to move. How, do you agree with that? Do, do you agree with the single planet dependency risk uh, argument? No, I don't really agree with that notion because of the fact that the Earth is uh, a vibrant planet and it can change and we have to live with the changes and it did change in the past. So I don't really do it or think of it as a matter of we have to leave the Earth so we can live somewhere else. No, mm -hmm. we're going to continue to live on the Earth. The Earth will continue to supply life with what is needed, but we need to learn not to escape life on Earth, but we need to learn about the universe. It is, mm -hmm. it is really a wonderful thing to extend our knowledge to beyond the Earth. Always we benefit from that. Do you think there's life outside Earth? Oh, Earth? Most likely. Most likely there are all kinds of life forms because they, they, when you look at the, the, the sky and see all of these dots, which we call the stars, each one of them is a huge galaxy. And each one of the galaxies has billions of stars, and mm -hmm. and all all of these billions of stars have billions of planets around them. So why would the, the Earth be the only one that had life in it? So and, I and, think and, that and other beings. Do you think that there are other beings? Why not? Why? It's not. It's not. Uh, it is not out of this realm at all. Doctor Fabu, are are we ready as humans? Uh, are our brains? ready to understand those discoveries? Is science evoluting, evolving in a way and technology evolving in a way that would make us understand what's happening outside our radar? Do you think we are ready to understand or the brain is ready to develop and evolve accordingly? Of course, of course. Our, our human beings, are. We, we understood all kinds of things in the past and we continue to learn in the, fu in the future and we we, we certainly have the capability and our minds can expand. It is just how much do we, uh, do we prepare our minds to expand. Every child has a great, great capacity if you thoroughly uh, at, uh, at, uh, help him to understand things step by step. So uh, another risk that also Musk talk about, talks about is the artificial intelligence and the possibility of, of robots or artificial intelligence taking um, um, part or taking the place of humans and uh, as, as a risk. So do you tend to agree with that? Do you think we were going to reach a, a, a phase in life where robots and, and artificial intelligence take part in, in jobs that we do or demolish the humankind? No, yeah. never demolish it. I don't think they will ever demolish the humankind. The humans, humans are the ones that invent all of these machines. And we will continue to invent machines to do things for us, and dangerous things or the repetitive things. And that's very good that we're able to do that because human beings invented planes, invented this, invented that. And all of that is very good. So we continue, we'll continue invention and we'll continue to generate things that can be done by other things rather than humans, but it is really the, the, uh, the, the character of the human beings being able to, do, to make these things and make them to help us, not to replace us. Not to replace us. So, Dr. Farouk, um, what, what do you think would be the next revolution? The industrial revolution was in the early 19th century, and then we are living now the digital technology revolution. So what do you think would come next? Health, metaphysics, understanding the unknown? What do you think, in, in your opinion, as a scientist and from your own reading, would that mean? It's an expansive revolution to expand our knowledge beyond the Earth and beyond the solar system. I really think we are now approaching a phase where we can begin to think about the universe rather than the solar system.
the universe at large. And I believe technology will take will help in that in that uh, evolution and discovery. Very so, much so. So we are now living in, in the Corona times. Uh, unluckily, we had to face this big challenge and uncertain times. And many people believe that uh, what we are witnessing now uh, is not pure by coincidence. It could be man-made virus, or uh, we are facing a biological world between great powers. So what is your insight on this? What do you, what, in your opinion, uh, is it a mankind virus? or it's just a pandemic that came on its not, own? Not at all. I don't think it is man-made at all. I think it is a natural occurring thing. And, and that happens every, every few centuries. Something comes up to mm -hmm. affect human beings everywhere. That happened in, in Europe in the Middle Ages and that have happened in everywhere in the world. We had the AIDS before and we had all kinds of other things in the past and I really think it is just one of these diseases that we did not understand, we did not prepare for and we're beginning to understand it and that's that's fine and, and these things will hit things like it will hit us in the future. To what extent do you think that investing in scientific research could actually help us prevent national natural disasters? And essential, essential. That, that Wake up call. Absolutely. It is a wake-up call to tell all of these governments that scientific research is very important. Never mind building huge things for the, for the, the prime minister to live in and let us build the scientific research methodologies and scientific research groups to help us figure out what's happening in the, in the universe and what will happen tomorrow. Prepare the world with, for, with better science. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Dr. Farouk, you are also a professor and you taught for so many years and i believe that the corona now and covid 19 has a great implication on education so in your opinion where are we heading in terms of education especially in the states where it hosts the top universities of the world so what is the direction after corona what what are the majors that will arise how can we prepare our young generation to to be uh, to, to learn and to be in the right domain or to, to, to pursue the right measures? Well, first of all, we need to make absolutely certain that scientific research and education in science with all the, the kids everywhere mm -hmm. in the U.S. and abroad uh, is uh, capable of informing our children and our people to how to deal with these, uh, with these uh, problems because they are scientific problems and the approach to deal with them is a scientific approach. Mm -hmm. So this, that, that, it's a, there is a great deal that we have already learned and we will continue to learn. Mm -hmm. So t talking, talking again about, uh, about youth and education and uh, the labor market, um, back when you were involved with the Apollo mission, I remember you told me once that the average age of the astronauts and everyone that worked uh, on that mission was around 26 years old. Yes. So young people were empowered enough to discover the unknown back then. And now we see that our young generation is facing a lot of limitations in terms of quality education, in terms of unemployment, in terms of, of there's a lot of disappointment and depression among youth. And COVID-19 came cherry on the cake to add to that uh, depression or anxiety. So what would you advise those young people who have no hope in some countries to find jobs or to, to realize their dreams, if I may say. They should really continue to push for recognition. I'm always saddened when I see throughout the Arab world people in the mid-20s uh, mid that are they consider their kids or stupid little kids or, or mm. still people that need to be this and that. And um, I, I, as you said, I, rem I remember our discussion about the fact that it was 26 years old because it was stunning to us. I was standing with a few of the astronauts and it was stunning to us that those who are responsible for the mission, all aspects of the mission and the life of the astronauts were the average age was 26. That day I was 29 years old. I was responsible for the selection of landing sites. I was responsible for the training of, of the astronauts on what to see and what to look for and what to photograph. 20 years old, 29 years old. Show me a 29 year old man or woman in the Arab world that's responsible for something of that nature. Then, so it is, it's very sad to see the Arab youth 
being considered kids and not having options, not be given in, in, in enough respect and enough jobs to do. Give them the jobs. Even if they mess it up, fine, they will learn. Because, because during the Nasser years, we could also, also say that, okay, give him the job. If he, if, he, if he messes it up, fine, he will learn from it. And we, we actually knew that, and we, we did that. We said, give him that job, he will learn from it, and he will become better. But he will learn from it, we will give it to him now. He has the, the, the energy, and we love the fact that all of these people, the 26-year-old people, had enough energy because they could sit at this, their stations for eight hours, not moving one inch, not eating a thing, not bringing a thing, but sitting there because he knows that this is something very important thing and he has the control of it and he will sit there for eight hours, not move and do it very well. Wow. And then leave very, feeling great. And I believe because they were empowered enough and they had the opportunity and the chance to, to explore their potential and be in a decision-making position, which sadly we look in, in our, in the world right now, you can never, you don't see young people in major decision-making or leading position. And exactly. Exactly. We that's, should believe more in our youth, in our young generation and children. Exactly. And, uh, and that's why the Arab world looks very old. The whole Arab world, each and every country, looks very old because the people that ran in are very old. People like me with white hair and very old looking and very old speaking and very old thinking. And that's, and that's why they, they still sit in their holes in the ground, never really coming up to breathe air from the, the sun. But you know, Doctor, what is also um, unfortunate is back then in your years when you were a young graduate, you couldn't find a matching job opportunity as well in, in Egypt. And you had to travel and you had to go and look for jobs in, in the US or else. So the problem is still the same. We're talking about the same issue, the same problem. Uh, since then till now with no solutions, uh, ba there's barely a, a window of hope. Uh, for those young people, especially now with this current situation. And it, it's heartbreaking to see that young people are deprived from their basic rights and, and opportunities just to work and to make their own living. Do you advise them to travel? I mean, the, the COVID situation now um, uncovered everything that is happening around the world. We were just talking, uh, you and I, a while ago about uh, the fact that, that the scientific, the health situation in the entire world, the healthcare system crashed. So what will those young people do? Travel to where? <laughs> no, 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 I would say travel will solve the problem, not at all, because many of the people that travel have messed up lives and mm -hmm. live very uncomfortable lives and never accomplish anything too. And uh, the vast majority actually return back and disappointed so it's it's not the fact that uh, travel or going somewhere is going to help you and do it not at all it's the matter of perseverance it's a matter of improving yourself constantly even if you are not finding a job let's mm -hmm. see how many of the people that can not finding a job are trying to improve their knowledge constantly all the time by reading from magazines or reading from books or listening to somebody that is giving a lecture somewhere it is the lack of educating the youth that you must improve yourself constantly so that you will be able to, to satisfy the inner soul, that satisfy yourself in that you're doing a, a good job somewhere. It doesn't matter somewhere, but you have to respect yourself. And you cannot respect yourself really unless you do the best possible job that you can. So this okay. is important. That you have to seek self-respect. And where do you get that? by showing to yourself that you are doing the best possible job that there. And to do the best possible job that you have to prepare yourself in the best possible way. And how do you do that? By reading as much as you can, by learning as much as you can, by looking at magazines and figuring out things in it, not by complaining or bitching or fighting or doing anything like that. Absolutely. So, so what, what three main areas of, 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 of learning you recommend for the young people right now to focus on? like three areas that think we are heading towards? I wouldn't actually restrict people under what, what, what you read on. Do it in the things that you like, 
and do it at the things that you that you think are important you, to you personally. Because somebody that can read in, in psychology can be a very significant person. Mm -hmm. Or a woman that would read in, in, in mathematics, so great, fine, even though that there are not too many jobs or, or idea, places for women to advance in, 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 in mathematics, but, but, but you go ahead, if, if you like it, go ahead, because you never know. You can open new doors for yourself. So I wouldn't restrict the types of material to read or the kinds of things to advance in. Just advance yourself. Keep adding knowledge to yourself. And when you add knowledge, also continue to try to convey knowledge to others. Uh, it is uh, one of the things that I learned from my father, who was a, uh, a, a, a leader in the Azhar University in Cairo, was the fact he always said, if you, you, if you know something, you have to teach others, or else there is no benefit to your knowledge. So you should, whatever you learn, Try to teach your friends, your family, your kids, your anybody that you can. You convey that knowledge, and when you convey that knowledge, you feel very good about the fact that aha, you Absolutely. learned and you made that knowledge useful. Absolutely, so and and especially nowadays, people have ample time to read and to invest in themselves and in their skills because of the social distancing and the, the current situation. So I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to learn as much as possible, to discover what we want to do in life, to put plans, to try and as well keep our sanity because it's not easy to survive the current crisis and, and be okay about it and, and come out of it as sane people. I think it's a big challenge that we are facing now and especially if there's wave two of, of this corona. What do you think? Do you think there will be a wave two? Indeed, indeed, yeah, there might be. Most likely, the doctor said that there will be wave, wave two, and uh, and therefore they know. And so there, I agree with with what, and they will not really go out until we see what's happening in the, in the fall, because this is when they ex expect the wave two to come in September, October. So we'll see what happens. Will Will you take the vaccine if it's uh, developed? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, of yes. course. And the, and the vaccine will it will not be announced unless it is useful and it is good to do. Absolutely. Well, well, because many people fear you like injecting themselves with something that is still not tried or, or new. Um, there's a big, you know, big argument about the vaccine and what it will entail. And you know, some people believe in conspiracies and and uh, the unknown. So, will you will you, will you personally take it? Of course, I would. The, the medical profession is doing a very good job, and they're trying their best. And I don't think the medical profession would do something that harms humans whatsoever under any circumstances, not at all. Hopefully. So, uh, Dr. Faro, apart from your, um, from your work with NASA before, with, uh, as a professor, you are also an advisor and have been an advisor for so many presidents. And I personally know about some stories when you sit and talk. So how, how is being an advisor to presidents in our part of the world feel like? Do they listen? Do you think that the advice is get implemented? Uh, is there room for negotiation, for discussions? What's well, a good point, because I, I really think that most uh, advice to the presidents, has, presidents in our uh, region have mm -hmm. been kind of lukewarm and not really tough. But I really think, believe that uh, good, uh, good presidents and good leaders would listen to things like that. I, for instance, I remember with presidents of that, I told him that once he was going to talk to somewhere and he was going to say, maybe I should go to such and such place. And I told him, Mr. President, maybe you should go to the to Cairo University, so to speak to the students. He said, well, that is a good idea. I said, and when you go, Mr. President, do not take with you a written statement. Just speak to the kids. You have girls and, and, a, and a boy that went to school, to, to, to university. You have to speak to them as if you are talking to your kids. He said, well, I will try that. And he did. And he went to Cairo University without a single sheet of paper and he spoke from his heart and it was a fabulous speech and it was something that affected a great deal of, of his popularity. So it really is like this what you can. The entire world is going through natural resources scarcity, especially water. So based on your experience and your knowledge as a specialist in this field, uh, which regions or countries do you think ha might have undiscovered reserves of water or oil 
if we're talking about this part of the world or else? Well, we still, uh, Egypt needs to, to explore a lot more of the, the, the delta of the Nile that's under the water of the Mediterranean. The delta of Egypt that we see today is only one third the size of the Nile Delta. Two thirds of the Nile Delta is under the water of the Mediterranean. Two thirds. Because, yeah, because the Mediterranean is just a, was a hole in the ground. And the mm -hmm. Nile came in and dumped all of this stuff much further out than the, what, what the border of the Mediterranean Sea is now. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of material that was dumped into the into north north of e north of the border of Egypt. Two thirds. Uh, wow. And, and I know you are also involved in, look, in, in looking uh, for water, drinking water in deserts as well, right? Yes. And uh, yes. And why is that? It's actually because we, we realize that all of the features in the desert today were formed by rain, running water, mm -hmm. which means that there was a great deal of water in the past for some reason or other. We finally actually figured out the reason later is because of the fact that uh, uh, Africa was uh, closer to the to the the uh, North Africa was closer to the the uh, uh, equator, and Africa has been moving up like that northward, and the equator has been moving shifting southward like okay. that, and therefore there was a great deal of rain in the past, and that, all of the features that we see in the desert today that was formed by water were created by water, and therefore some of that water would have still be uh, saved in the in the rock beneath. Uh -huh, interesting. So, so Dr. Saru, um, when when you when you look at those presidents and and very shrewd presidents who took your advice and and actually you you, you changed the map. You, you actually changed a map and the borders with your advice. Um, do you think they they trusted your opinion? And this is the power of scientists. I believe they are well respected. Is it due because you are a scientist who studied abroad in the US and came back with that international recognition? If you were just an Arab scientist, Arab living in the Arab world, and you know, we, ha we, we, we tend to have this, in, in a way, inferiority complex sometimes. So do you think it had to do with that, respecting your opinion, other than, of course, your solid knowledge in the field? Yes, I think it must have had to do with that, uh, the fact that uh, I was highly respected within NASA and the uh, New York Times and magazines and Time and Life magazine and so on wrote my name and wrote about the fact that I was the one selecting the landing sites and the one that astronauts talk to me from the moon and the ones that that uh, I have trained. and or, So it, it must have affected uh, people in this fashion and therefore they began to think of, of the fact that I have actually done my work and I, I expect them to respect me because I, I would not say something that would... And they tried me out too. They, they figured out that I'm not going to tell them something that's for the hell of it. And I, will, I will actually not speak my mind unless I know what I'm talking about. What, Dr. Peru, what gives you more inner satisfaction when you are recognized internationally or nationally? I know you have received so many awards uh, from NASA Apollo Achievement Award, the Certificate of Merit of the World Aerospace Education Organization, uh, Egypt is Married First Class, and so many, so many awards and recognitions. What gives you more satisfaction? Is it the type of the award that you receive or the source of the award? I think both have something to do with it. The first award that I got from Egypt was the Order of Merit, first class, and that, that I loved very much because my father had taken the, from President Nasser the, uh, uh, the same award. So to me, it was really something super fantastic. But also the recognition from the Geological Society of America, when they were naming things after my name and awards in my name and uh, the recognition within the scientific community also is very important because of the fact that I am a scientist and their recognition is, is, is satisfies my inner soul. No question about it. Both of them. So what is, what is the, the project or, or um, the science discovery that you worked on or research that was the most challenging in your career? It, have, it must have been the, uh, the uh, uh, the de desert, desert research, because we really knew very little about the deserts. And I realized that only in 1974, when I 
began the uh, training of the astronauts for the Apollo Soyuz mission. It was an Earth orbital mission. And they brought in experts in geology and in oceanography and so on from the very best of the scientists everywhere in the, in the US. Mm -hmm. And I realized that all everybody and the scientists answered all the good, good questions very well, except the experts on, on dry lands or the deserts. They didn't really know how to answer things. They didn't know the reason for when sands are light colored or reddish color or whitish colored. I had no idea of what, how these features were formed. And so I thought myself, I'm a geologist, and what is it that mm -hmm. I know about the desert in Egypt or of the Arab world? And I realized that I really know very little. And therefore I thought, okay, I will learn about the desert myself. And I did. Are you, are you currently involved in, in any project for water, drilling for water in, in, in deserts? From everywhere, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in, in Morocco, in, in Libya, in, in all kinds of places, and all of this, all of it with, with some of my students. I'm, I'm really very, very proud mm -hmm. of my uh, PhD students that have taken my the PhD with me in, uh, from, from everywhere in the Arab world and in Egypt and even in the US. And they are all working still and they are involving me in their work. And mm -hmm. I am very proud of that. Dr. Farouk, speaking about science discovery and evolution, um, what, what do you think, in, in, in your opinion, is one of the most important science dis discoveries in the last decade? I don't think we can de 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 define the best uh, scientific discoveries so soon. It really is, has to wait a while, several decades, before, before we realize that, oh, that was something that changed our minds or something that helped humanity. Mm -hmm. Who is your favorite scientist? The favorite scientist? Yeah. Actually, the, my favorite scientist is not a scientist. Uh -huh. He's René Descartes. Because he, René Descartes was a French philosopher that he said, and he wrote in German, actually, and he said there is, uh, there is nothing so far removed from us that we cannot reach or so of, uh, what written that we can, uh, so hidden that we cannot discover it. And I used to tell the astronauts that because it's something that is, we have, we should be able to find out about everything that we see and we should uh, f f reach any place that we cannot reach and find out about it scientifically. Interesting. So um, finding about things scientifically, what do you consider your, your, your best achievement to date? Scientific achievement. Recognizing the location of groundwater in deserts, because this is finding water for mm -hmm. people that do not have it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Dr. Faru, uh, you, you reach to the moon. What is your next level? What next? What comes next? People usually dream to, <laughs> dream to reach the moon. For you, you have done it all. You have been everywhere. You have done it all at an, a very, very young age. What keeps you going what what do you look for what is what is next there is mars and the potential <laughs> of water on mars <laughs> <laughs> take me with you <laughs> when you go to mars I, I, know, I know you are currently writing a book you're writing your own book so can you tell us briefly about it just a, a book about my life and my research but specifically and my, my the kinds of things that i found out and where and and the kind of lessons that I have learned for the gen younger generations. So I start with uh, about one third of it was the Apollo program, and then one third of it is about the, the desert research, and one third of it was about the, the politics and what I learned from dealing with, uh, with, with presidents and the youth in the Arab world and th things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So it's, it will have many scoops. And yes. And that, no, no. yes, it's about my life in total or in general. Amazing. Looking forward to, to receiving, uh, to, to reading it. So, uh, Dr. Farouk, some of us do have mentors in their lives who inspired them. And this talk is, comes within a series of inspirational talks to inspire young people and even adults, um, whether in their professional development or their personal development. Who inspired you? Who mentored you? And, and what advice did you keep with you all those years and that is still applicable. Well, I think it's my, my father, the way he 
he respected books and the way he would, instead of just talking about something, he would go and reach the, li the little library that he kept in his bedroom, mm -hmm. covered with a glass, and then he would take a book and then will move the, his hand over the books to make sure absolutely that there is not a speck of dust on the book and then sit down and put the book on his lap and we would sit around him and then he would open up and look at some pages and tell us what it, what it reads exactly and then explain it to us. So I really think he uh, inspired me in learning by myself from a book, read something and develop things from it, mm -hmm. explain it to people and read something from it because he used to also say مَنْ يَعْلَمْ فَعَلَيْهِ أَنْ يُعَلِّمَ النَّاسِ وَإِلَّا فَلَا نَفْعَ فِي عِلْمِهِ Meaning yeah. that those who know should teach others or there is no benefit to their knowledge. Absolutely. Before going to the audience questions, my last, last question to you is what keeps you grounded and humble and keeps your feet on ground? We see many people around us who did not achieve half what you have achieved. And they become arrogant, they become full of themselves. So what is the key word that keep us that keeps us grounded in your opinion? Just the knowledge that the fact that I know only a fraction of the knowledge and I have reached a fraction of the people that I wish to reach and I have done a fraction of what I wish to do, do for Egypt and the Arab world. Interesting. Thank you, Dr. Fadou. Um, um, we, we have maybe around 10, 15 minutes. And this is uh, to go through the questions of the audience. We already have so many questions. We tried to filter them and uh, to answer some of the questions that uh, we haven't tackled through our talk so far. So one question is, um, uh, he, Dr. Fadou had countless success achievements, but what were his failures, uh, or I would, I might say, challenges, and how did he overcome them? Oh, lots of failures. I have already, the, the very first one is the fact that I wanted to go to medical school, and the, uh, the teacher said, "Here, this kid is going to be a great uh, brain surgeon." And I thought to myself, "I'm going to be a surgeon for sure." So my first failure was not to get enough mm -hmm. grades in high school to go to medical school. This was a huge thing, and then. The, uh, uh, the uh, going to the United States of America and trying to find a job and finding a job was very difficult. And there was for half a year with a wife and two kids. And, and so uh, that was a failure, not able to find a job. And I had to immediately do something different. So I had, I worked as a painter, house painter. To, to subsidize myself and my wife and kids for half a year. And so I was painting with a PhD in geology. I was painting rooms and, and houses as, as, a, as, a, as a helper to some, some painting company. I wasn't even my own. My own wow. son, or I should paint. So there were all kinds of things that happened that you live through them and you do them and you have to do it. All kinds of things in life that you, you have to do, must you do. And you do them, and you come out, and you feel feel accomplished that you did them, and you move on. And probably learn from those challenges. Sure. Become sure. To this day, I'm, to this day, I'm a great painter, house painter. You are? <laughs> Interesting. So uh, our next question is: What is Dr. Farouk's impression on the UAE mission to Mars, and what it will add to the Arab world? Fabulous. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, the United, United Arab Emirates is, is doing so wonderful things. And the, the, it's the work of uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid who, was, who started the business of the, of the uh, he made a, a unit, a research unit in, in Dubai, uh, a center to do research and, and, and satellite imagery. And he did a fabulous job there. And then he pushed for the potential for astronauts to go into a space station. And they did. We have, uh, one sort of, uh, did uh, one Arab man went to into a space station a year ago, and then next year we will have a, a mission to Mars, and all of that is is fabulous. So I think that, and then Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid also said that he is going to subsidize a satellite to to be in Earth orbit to serve the Arab nation. So this is something super fantastic. So I think Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid has done a wonderful job. 
for his country and f f first for, for Dubai, Emirate of Dubai, and then mm -hmm. for the country of Dubai, and then for the whole Arab world, and then for space studies. So it's, it's something that one can look at a leader, give him a great big salute because of what he's done, and say that, yes, we need more people like that so that we can lift, uplift the Arab world to greater heights. Absolutely. There is an interesting question. As a geologist, would you be able to tell us whether we truly used or consumed most of the Earth's natural capital, which make human life possible? In other words, how many more years can we survive as residents on planet Earth before we run dry? A lot. That's fine. The, the, the Earth's resources are fabulous and are vast, and we can still go all, all kind of areas and we can still go much deeper and we will learn how to get deeper in the, in the earth and get more of these and different elements even. So we're, we still have a lot to do on, on earth and the earth can subsidize us if we have the intelligence to do it right and not to hurt it. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is, do you believe the speed of humanity and countries have geared in for the last 50 years is healthy or are we going too fast? that we're going to be missing our precise landing spot towards the end of the day? No, I don't really think that we're going too fast. I think that we're, we're moving forward and we're learning all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There are countries that go a little too faster mm -hmm. than others and there are lots, many, many countries go slower than mm -hmm. others, like the rest of the Arab world, the, all the Arab world is going slower than all the rest. So there are variations in the speed of progress uh, and here and there, but in general, we're doing fine and we're going to reach greater heights and we will be using more of the resources of the earth very nicely and intelligently and we are going to have better life in the future. No question in my mind. Which, which sources, Doctor, are the most uh, rare or scarce right now? What shall we protect? Water? What, what other resources we are running out of? Yeah, water is may, maybe the, the, the most significant resource, and, but we're learning a great deal about water today and we're, we're, we're beginning to really understand it and to respect it enough. Okay. Um, there's a question, it's, it's a little bit long, I'll try to uh, summarize. The human body is so well balanced and the role of each organ is well defined. Hence, it doesn't compete with each other, but rather complement. Same with nature. Can Dr. Farouk give us his honest opinion on why are we as humans truly competing today and in a very destructive manner? And would the new gene, in his opinion, resemble the human organs and complement among each other or follow the same pattern their predecessors engineered for personal interest? <laughs> Long question. <laughs> yes. We were talking about lack of humanity recently, right? And, yeah, and no, but, but, but competition does not mean lack of humanity. I mean, we can compete with each other. I think competition is very good. I really think if we, if there was no competition, we will still be living in, in, the, in the streets rather than having a comfortable life. And so competition is excellent and it is very good. It has uplifted humanity and there is no, nothing wrong with competition. But when, while you're competing, don't forget those who have not. That's all. Mm -hmm. So we're, while you're competing and you're going up and up and up, up, don't forget the ones that are way down and don't, don't walk over them. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking about your role and support for civil society organizations, and such as Winter Arabia and else. And um, before actually going to that question, um, it occurred to my mind that and, and when, when are we going to see models like what we see in the West of big philanthropists giving their fortune and donating most of their fortune to, to civil society organization and for a better world for developing mankind or solving humanitarian issues. When do you think we will ever see those examples in the Arab world, knowing that there's a big wealth in this part of the world? Of course we will. And we have some examples of that. And uh, uh, the, the, the creation of mentor is one, one example of that. So, of course, we will. And it is happening at a very small amount, yes, very slow, yes, but it, is, it, it happens and we will continue to see it grow as we, as we raise the level of knowledge in the Arab world and as we raise the level of feelings for the Arabs in the Arab world. 
and uh, so the, so this would be would be growing with the growth of our intellect and growth of our knowledge so i'm, I'm not worried about that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question here was, do you think that civil society organization can have an impact in contributing to a better future for the Arab world? Of course, of course. Civil society is very important. And this was something that the Arabs have in the, all in the past used to do. Mm -hmm. And it is now very little done. But I really think that uh, most Arabs realize that it is an important something to do. And they will fear for others, and they will protect each other. So that I really think, with knowledge and with education, with training people, uh, and with educating people the right education, I think that will also increase okay. worrying for each other and uplifting each other. Absolutely. What one of the audience is asking, saying that of course you are all model for so many young people in the Arab world and globally, I might say. Uh, beyond your scientific achievements, you are also a great supporter for women and women empowerment and women contributions. So how do you assess that situation today in the Arab world in terms of women empowerment and women opportunities, especially in the leading decision and decision making positions? Still very bad. Still we need to have a, 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 to have rise up to, uh, to the level of, of respect of humanity. By, de by dealing with women as, as, as equal as men, if not a little better, because in real life, most women are a little better mm -hmm. than men. And we have to recognize that. And if you look at the, the governments in the Arab world, very rarely would you see the people in the higher up positions that are women. And that's very bad. And this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is a major reason for the Arab world to be so left behind, is the fact that women are not taking... Uh, enough of respect and enough of positions because we keep more than half of the of the population down under and we don't use their abilities we don't use their mind we don't use their consciousness that's Absolutely. why we are in bad shape so there is no question about it in my mind that the Arab world is way behind because of the fact that women are not taking an equal post to men mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're going to take two or three more questions before we end our talk so I, uh, there's one question about Lebanon. Have you ever been an advisor to any Lebanese president before? No, not, not to the, the, the Lebanese okay. president. I've, I, I have been a, a, a kind of talking quite a bit to uh, uh, individuals, uh, but I have not been uh, an advisor to any, any one of the, uh, the presidents. If you, if you are, what, what would your advice be right now in this current situation and economic crisis? And all Never that. mind all the people with gray hair like this. <laughs> look, around, around, look around you, you see people with black hair like that girl sitting there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and depend on them. Let them run their own show. They will make mistakes fine, but they will correct them and they will uplift the country. The country is very mm -hmm. young, is very vigorous, is very fun-loving, is very energetic. Use that energy and use that wonderful spirit of the Lebanese to build their country. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. So uh, before our last question, how did you know that track you wanted to continue in your life? What made you choose what you are now? And was it something you didn't expect or a track you didn't ever thought you would be working on? I never expected that track at all. As, as I said, I really wanted to be a, a medical a doctor and a brain surgeon for that matter. And I thought I would live in Egypt and become a great medical, medical, medical doctor. But uh, so I, what I am now is a man looking at rocks everywhere in the world and visiting deserts in China and in India and Australia and everywhere in the world. And so I'm doing something that I did not expect at all. But Which all desert, I, huh? Which desert, uh, uh, desert fascinated you the most? Well, actually, part of the desert of China was most fascinating because some of the, the, the dunes in the, in the middle of the desert were in, just in the middle of a valley, in a, in a little hole, in a bowl, the bowl-shaped depression with mountains, great big mountains around it, and there are sand dunes there. And I told the, I, I was with a bunch of uh, Chinese geologists, actually the head of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and head of this and that. And then I was telling them that that sand was formed by water because all the sand in the world come, was formed by water. And they told me, no way, because there is no water here ever. 
is the sand must be made brought in by 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 wind. I said, what wind? We are in a ball shaped depression. It is a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a hole in the ground with the dunes in the middle. And they I I pointed out to the the little valleys on the mountain ranges that are brought they broken up pieces of the sand together and they proved that and then i told them if you drill here you will find water yes, they said no way the technical desert there would be absolutely no water and they some 40 years later they drilled a well and they found lots of water 40 years later <laughs> yes. uh, i have no doubt i have no doubt but yes. dr Farouk, thank you we have our our talk unfortunately has come to an end I would like to thank you so much for such an inspiring and enlightening talk uh, in so much humbleness and, and uh, smooth approach. I couldn't be prouder to take part in this talk, which I would add on my resume for the rest of my life. It's our second talk, actually. I remember the first one was in Egypt with, with thousands of, of young people. And I must say, when we were walking down the street to go to the uh, American University campus, Greek campus, uh, and rise up summit, uh, people were literally climbing on Dr. Farouk <laughs> to either take photo or to, to say hello or to salute you. So I am, you make us all proud as, as Arabs. And, and I would like to, to say that, uh, and taking your word, thank you and the word is yours now. Thank you very much, Soraya. I'm very proud of you. As much as you're saying that you're proud of me, that I'm very proud of you as a young Arab woman who has proved herself and proved her ability to, to, to become a very fine director of the Minister Arabia. And I am very proud of the fact that I'm on your board and that I'm, I'm also proud of the people that work for you and the way you dealt with them. And so I am, I am here to say thank you for, for what you do and thank you for being what you are.